So tonight's lecture, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce John Rogers, who is a PhD student at Swansea University. I've known John for quite a few years now. He started as an undergraduate at Swansea, certainly one of the best students that Swansea has had in recent years, before going on to do uh, an MA in Egyptology at, at Swansea also. And he's recently received uh, um, funding in order to do his, uh, his PhD at Swansea, which is on the 26th dynasty, looking at the reign of, um, uh, of Samtek uh, the first. Uh, that's a totally different subject. Uh, he did do his undergraduate dissertation on uh, musical instruments uh, and music in general, which he's very interested in um, and is a keen music player as well. He'll be joined in the second part of the lecture by Catherine List, who is uh, a student of conservation at Cardiff University, who will be giving her input uh, on the conservation side of things. So I'll pass over to John and I'll mute myself now. So John, uh, over to you. Uh, hello, uh, hoping everyone can see me. Uh, it's wonderful to be joining you all today. And I'd like to thank Ken uh, for inviting me to talk uh, with you about uh, the musical items in the Egypt Center under this title of all the words unspoken, a faience flute and the materiality of music. Um, along with this image of uh, I telling his mate that your music sounds fine as long as I cover my ears. And although I must admit that I'll not be talking too much about the uh, materiality side of things here, uh, what I'll do uh, is briefly go over some of the more theoretical aspects of studying ancient music before showing the various objects we have, uh, and then finishing off by taking a deeper look at W247, our infamous whistle or flute, where I'll be joined um, by a Catherine List, uh, who's a conservation student in Cardiff, looking with the whistle, uh, and she'll give a rundown of what's been happening over the last few months before lockdown. And we'll fit all of this uh, into an hour, uh, maybe, um, but let's see how it goes. So what is music? Well, music is fundamentally important to nearly every society that has ever existed. It is a powerful tool for bonding and creating group identity, uh, as well as a means of transmitting stories uh, and memories between people and between generations. It mediates and manages social relations. Music plays an important part in our own culture, uh, from television soundtracks to music festivals, to religious experience, uh, to background music while working. But when it comes to studying music, we immediately run into problems. What do we mean when we say music? The term is completely bound up in the conceptualization of the culture that has created it. In other words, what we think of as music would almost certainly not be recognized as music by any ancient society. And this has led many to talk instead of deliberate sound uh, when studying the ancient world, of which music would be a part. Uh, if we think about our own culture, we have sounds that are generally considered to be musical and other created sounds that are not. So I hope most people would agree with me in saying that uh, Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture is a piece of music. But I also imagine uh, that most people would agree with me that a police siren is not a piece of music. But ultimately, uh, while the former is far more complex than the latter, their form and function are broadly the same. Both are a series of sounds designed to be memorable and to convey a message to whoever listens. So why is one music and the other not? Because the context is different, and particularly the cultural function is different. One is for entertainment, the other for demanding urgency. But a later archeologist or historian who is faced with both sounds without knowing that context would struggle to identify the meanings encoded in each, and would probably label both as music. So when we are looking at ancient cultures, we need to be very careful uh, when we talk about ancient music and not to call all sound created music. Because the definition of music is a cultural phenomenon 
changes between cultures, we must uh, insist on examining not only the technical, uh, but the social aspects of sound in the ancient world to attempt to distinguish music as well as musical contexts and forms. Now, having said all of that, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will be referring to music as simply for ease, and, and I'll admit that straight off. But there is a distinction that we need to bear in mind and be alert to. Uh, but whatever the context, understanding the role of music in a society throws light onto the memories, experiences, and identities expressed within that society. And so it's therefore a shame that for the most part, uh, manifestations of music as a cultural phenomenon have traditionally played only a minor part in our understanding of the cultural fabric uh, of Egyptian society. Historically, the study of ancient music has often focused on finding technical principles of Egyptian music, such as scales, notation, and musical forms in what uh, can be called an archaeomusicology. And these efforts have had mixed, mixed success, uh, sometimes good, sometimes questionable. Uh, for example, uh, several scholars have, have, um, have attempted to identify the pitch of harp strings by measuring the relative length of strings as represented on tomb walls. While this works broadly, the note coming from a plucked string is affected quite a bit more by tension than length, and the pitch of a note does not usually rise in a straight line as tension increases. And so there's, there's simply not enough information and too many variables to speak in anything but the broadest of terms in these cases, a fact that is, that is easily admitted. But alongside this, uh, the research trend has changed in the last few decades, with studies uh, also focusing on the cultural role of sound in the landscape and in religion. Uh, the, the term soundscape has become popular, related to the term landscape, and most simply means uh, the study of how sound was created, transmitted, and perceived within the ancient landscape. And this is part of the, the larger discipline of archaeoacoustics, the study of sound in the past, which encompasses our artistic questions, uh, how and why were musical objects made and shown in this way, uh, compositional questions, what sounds were made, uh, cultural questions, how were various sounds perceived, uh, communicational questions, how were sounds transmitted, uh, and historical questions, uh, how did meanings of sound change over time, as well as other issues of identifying and then interpreting uh, past sounds. While a lot of the recent work is moving towards this cultural and, and symbolic meaning of music, uh, there are four key areas where work is needed to bring the, techno the technical musicological focus and the social archaeoacoustic uh, research together. Firstly, there is a need to make the source data, that is the surviving material in museums, accessible for study through presentation and publication, a, a very small part of which we're doing today. Secondly, typologies or standardized categories of modern reference and need to be created or refined for Egyptian musicology. Thirdly, there is a need to study the cultural meaning of music within its own context, rather than seeking to compare Egyptian music with modern Western constructions of musicality. And fourthly, there's a need uh, for integrative study of the cross-cultural interactions of which music illustrates. And so in the next half hour, 40 minutes or so, of course, I'm not going to be able to do all of these. Uh, but my aim is rather simple, to show you the musical objects held in the Egypt Centre, most of which are modest and unassuming, uh, before looking at two of these objects in a little bit more depth, focusing on the technical aspects and laying the groundwork for the future more interpretive work, as this is still a work in progress. If you've been following these lectures, uh, you will be well acquainted with the history of the Egypt Centre by now, and will know something of how the collection came to be in Swansea. 
Like the majority of the items here, most of the musical objects came from the dispersal of the Welcome Collection in the 1970s. And we see him here rocking a moustache that I'm quite jealous of. And um, from that dispersal, most of our musical items are idiophones, you know, objects that make a sound by vibrating when struck in some way. Time for some pictures. We have uh, four fragments of Sistra and one almost complete example, which I will quickly show you. Uh, EC752 here uh, is a fragment of a Sistrum that came from the Welcome Collection in 1971. It's a classic uh, bifrontal Hathor image, 61 millimeters tall and is made of faience, so probably a votive uh, item. E23 here is very similar, also being made of faience with the bifrontal Hathor, uh, which preserves a small fragment of what was probably a Naos sistrum uh, in Egyptian, the Seshashet, um, which is always a bit of a tongue twister. But Hathor heads in the form of Sistra are, are well known to have been offered in temples from at least the New Kingdom onwards. And when we consider the fact that faience uh, would shatter quite easily when struck repeatedly, uh, it's quite a brittle material, it, it seems most suitable uh, to think of these as votive items. In the Egypt Center, we also have uh, three metal Sistra. So AB20 here uh, is a fragment from a Sistra made from a copper alloy. It's unfortunately quite corroded, as you can see. Uh, the face is damaged, uh, but the ears and horns and one of the eyes uh, is still recognizable, which makes the, um, the Hattoric nature uh, quite clear. And we hope that once uh, the lockdown's over, we're able to, to maybe uh, take some new pictures and um, to work a bit more with these. But in the notes accompanying uh, AB20 here, um, it seems that Margaret Murray obtained this specific object from Abydos where it was presumably excavated. Um, she dated it to the 26th dynasty and sent it to John Bancroft Willans in 1903. And I need to thank uh, Ken for correcting me on this point. Uh, Willans then donated it to, to Aberystwyth University, who in turn gifted it along with uh, AB23 to the Egypt Center in 1997. It is, Unfortunately, uh, AB20, the only sistrum that we have uh, with a possible provenience, which is a real shame. Um, earlier this year, however, uh, Ken identified a further sistrum fragment, sorry, a further sistrum fragment uh, in the storeroom, uh, right on the very end here, EC1467A, which I don't know if you can see, but features uh, quite a nice cat on top. And uh, as a cat fan, I quite like this one. And I've put um, a photo of a well-preserved example uh, in the Met to give you an idea of what it might have looked like or the, or the vague uh, outline. EC 1467 was sent to Cardiff for conservation treatment in 2002, uh, but apart from that we know next to nothing about its history at the moment. It, it presumably uh, came from Welcome, but we're still tracking down the provenance of this object which, uh, which was recently excavated from the storeroom. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you uh, will notice that the bottom objects are not Sistra, uh, but I've put them in because I like them. Uh, the first uh, is an amulet uh, of Bez playing a tambour, not a tambourine. Uh, it's a round hand drum, which seems to have been called a ser, an ancient Egyptian. And the typology of drums is something that I'm in the process of writing up. And I, I keep saying I'm in the process of writing it up. I really need to get on with it. Um, but the second here uh, is a very well-known uh, ring bezel for those of you connected with the Egypt Center. And it's been published by Kate Boss Griffith uh, in 1980, and then by uh, Dr. Graves Brown in 2014. And those of you who did today's jigsaw uh, will be well acquainted with this ring bezel, and I hope you like it as much as I do. Uh, but alongside these these modest examples of Sistra, we have one almost complete uh, example of the Sistrum, uh, which is W553, a copper alloy loop Sistrum. In Egyptian, the Sechem, which is really quite nice. It's around 17 centimeters high and was bought by Welcome in July 1919 uh, in, at Sotheby's. 
I've added an image of a similar example in the British Museum, which preserves the form in a slightly more clear way, perhaps. The design included not only the bifrontal hator at the base of the loop, um, may, but what may be the remains of a cat at the very top of the loop, somewhat similar to this. I hope you can see my mouse cursor. Um, and at the bottom, uh, a rather worn depiction of Bez. I'm not sure how clearly you can see it, but Bez is depicted in the round, so to speak, uh, with a front uh, and a back in a, in a similar way uh, to the British Museum example. In terms of dating, we can only talk again in the broadest terms and assign a date in the Ptolemaic Roman era for the system. Uh, the popularity of this loop system over the Naos system in later epochs of Egyptian history, as well as the relative complexity, the iconographic development would push for a later date. While this system doesn't quite have the thicker metal at the top of the arch, which seems to be a characteristic of Roman era Sistra. The Sistrum in the British Museum here uh, is in fact from the Roman era, uh, so I've shown you the exception uh, against the rule. And uh, it shares many similarities with our Sistrum, so it, it really is difficult to say because there are always exceptions uh, when we talk about these kinds of historical criteria. So I can't be too prescriptive uh, with this, but we're definitely looking at the later stages of Egyptian history. Uh, to get a clearer understanding, we would have to look at the chemical construction of the alloy. It's probably a bronze, uh, but the relative level of tin in the compound would give us a better idea of the time frame uh, of production for this object. Now, uh, of course, give me a second. Of course, without provenience or detailed provenance, it's very difficult. Uh, to use these items in any interpretive structures or, or to bring them to bear on the problems and research focuses I outlined at the beginning. But other than Sistra, we also have a wonderful set of really cute wooden clappers. Most examples uh, of these clappers, which are, are quite cute, uh, have longer handles, which has led some to suggest that our example may have been for a child. Uh, of course, it could simply be just a different design. And there are many examples uh, of these clappers in museums around the world. Uh, an example from, uh, from Cairo uh, 69501, I think, also has these crossed lines on the outer boards, uh, like ours, uh, these kind of crossed lines here, and dates from the 3rd or 4th century AD, with other examples found at Koranis from the second uh, to the fourth centuries AD. Um, I've lost my cursor, there it is. These examples in the Kelsey Museum. There are also several uh, Coptic examples in ivory, uh, some coming from Makaha, just north of modern Minya. Um, so, um, uh, Journal d'Entrée uh, 60643, uh, for example. Some of these Coptic examples have uh, concentric circles uh, rather than the crossed lines. Uh, it's, it's been suggested that those ivory examples are votive um, because they would have been too fragile for use. Uh, but experiments were already done in the 1950s uh, by Hans Hickman, uh, which showed that ivory versions were just as durable as their wooden counterparts. Main difference being that an ivory example would produce a higher pitch uh, than its wooden uh, counterpart. And there are enough examples to make uh, something like a rudimentary typology. Uh, but this hasn't quite been done yet, and I'm afraid I don't really have the time uh, to go into it here, but I simply wanted to show you these objects to, uh, to help you with your museum withdrawal symptoms. So these are just some of the musical instrument pieces that we have in each centre. Now I would like to focus on two objects in particular, the bez bell uh, and our whistle. Uh, the first, the bez bell came to Swansea uh, from Woking College in 2012. Uh, it's featured uh, in the highlights booklet which recently came out, which showcases 30 objects voted by volunteers in the public and uh, I'm sure will make a great guide for your next visit. Uh, it's available uh, to donors through the Egypt Centre crowdfunding page, um, a link which, of which we'll have at the end of this um, PowerPoint, and uh, is a token of appreciation for your generous support 
uh, during these difficult times. But these bez bells, uh, usually made from bronze, are, are fairly common. Uh, the, ben, the bells tend to be a very small, and our example is just over three centimeters tall. There are numerous examples in Cairo and London with other examples in museums across the globe. And, and those of you connected uh, with the Petrie Museum will know of a few bronze examples there. The example, the Egypt Center, is made of a light green faience, which is perhaps indicative of a votive or amuletic item, especially with the, the strung loop at the top. There are in fact only a few bears bells made of faience which survive today. The closest example I could find is in the British Museum, uh, EA 1574-8. Uh, which is dated to the 26th dynasty, which unfortunately I don't have a photograph of, um, but this one in the bottom corner uh, here, uh, EA 66619 is also quite similar uh, and almost exactly the same size uh, from the Ptolemaic era. Now the information with our bell indicates that it came from Robert Mond, who excavated at Thebes and Armand. However, no other Bez Bells have a provenance recorded from either of these areas, and it could be that Mons simply bought the bell while on his travels. But in uh, 1949, Hans Hickman again created a basic typology of bells based on their shape. Uh, within the shape typology, Bez Bells would sit in type 1. Uh, in 1976, Anderson also created a typology for bells, which is quite similar in methodology to Hickman's, and our Bez Bell would maybe fall into type C or type B, it's, it's not entirely clear. But from an acoustic perspective, the shape is very poor. Uh, in conical bells, the fundamental note uh, resonates on the lip of the instrument, so, so the fundamental note would resonate on the lip here uh, in this bell. And so bells without a tapered lip are much quieter uh, than those that have one, and they don't resonate with the same force as those with the outward curving lip. But most Bez Bells are made in this hemispherical shape without a lip, whatever their material. We do have the conical bells with lips are from Egypt, so the design of the Bez Bells seems to be from choice rather than um, acoustic ignorance. And it seems that the purpose of the bez bell was not to create a loud sound. The shape was more important than the sound it produced. And while the shape of the bells are consistent, we can identify and distinguish at least three styles uh, of bez bell. First is the, the head of bez uh, in the round, as it were, with the second being the two-faced bez. So there are two faces on either side of the bell. And then the third one is a four-faced bell, uh, with the face of bez on one side and then around the other points, uh, a lion, a jackal, a ram, or maybe a crocodile. And we have examples of this from, uh, uh, from Tel Basta, from Tanis, from Kuala Kabir, as well as a number of other locations. It's not entirely clear at the moment whether they were made for different contexts or uses whether they display regional or temporal differences, or were simply differences in decorative style. And of course, the lack of, of specific uh, in situ archaeological provenience for any of these quite numerous objects uh, is quite frustrating. The, the potropaic significance of bells is well known, and these bells can be seen as apotropaic protectors, the sound of bells are warding off demonic entities. Whether the uh, other creatures on the, the, the third type of Bez Bell are also protective or being protected against uh, is unclear again. And the apotropaic qualities of these small bells are perhaps supported by an example which was probably found in a child grave in Qual Kabir from the Roman era. We, we've already mentioned uh, that from an, an acoustic perspective, the purpose of the bell was not to create a loud ringing sound. Uh, even in the bronze examples. It seems that from a Western perspective, these bells were more symbolic than practical. The sound of the bell are warding off evil influences by becoming the sound, or perhaps the voice, of Bez himself. And while slightly speculative, 
Perhaps these bells should not be seen as musical instruments per se, but as the material embodiment of the protective voice of Bez. Um, last year, um, Takaja Spakovska at uh, Swansea suggested to me that their function was perhaps somewhat like those of uh, modern bikers' gremlin bells. And I think she's right. And while I'm not suggesting that, uh, that there were ancient Egyptian bikers, in both cases, uh, the actual character of the sound itself is relatively unimportant. Instead, the sound is believed to act powerfully against any spirits who may be nearby in a way that is mysterious to a human. Uh, for bikers, uh, the gremlin bell picks up the evil gremlins hanging around on roads, uh, stops them getting into the engine, traps them inside the bell, and drives them mad until they leave. And the owner of, the, of a bez bell uh, may have treated uh, their bell with more urgency uh, than, a, than a modern biker, but it makes for a good example. Uh, either way, it seems that uh, WK44 enjoyed a useful life uh, as a provider of protective sound. Uh, the breakage line at the base of the bell, uh, now smoothed over the course of time, uh, is in line with what would be expected from damage through use, uh, with the tongue uh, cracking in uh, the inside of the bell uh, at the waist. Such damage would make it useless uh, musically, or perhaps more importantly, make it no longer the sound of bez. So is the sound made by a bez bell music or another form of deliberate sound? And perhaps that's something for uh, discussion later. Now the second instrument, which is what you came here for, uh, is so far unique in the Egyptological record. Both its design and materiality are so far completely unparalleled in pharaonic history. So I'm interested to see what people here uh, make of it. If you read the blog post that went up uh, back in January on the Egypt Center blog, you'll already know a lot of the information here, but there are new developments, uh, many of which uh, Catherine's gonna introduce us to in a few minutes time. Uh, this whistle's uniqueness makes it difficult to categorize, which has led some to suggest that it is a fake or a forgery. The only evidence for suggesting foul play is its uniqueness. And such negative evidence is not a strong enough criterion to question its validity. The materials and production show no sign of a modern origin and are in line with ancient examples of usage and processes. And so until there is any positive evidence to treat the subject with suspicion, we should be extremely careful when throwing around these very charged labels. Items, after all, are innocent until proven guilty. But, um, W247 uh, is a form of aerophone uh, and has traditionally been called a whistle, uh, which I will continue to call it for convenience. Uh, this whistle is currently in three parts and measures nine centimeters in total. And a close study of it shows that it is a complex object resulting from multiple construction processes. Uh, it's composed of an eight millimeter diameter copper-based metallic tube. The, the metal here is badly oxidized and many flakes were reattached uh, with adhesive during the last century. The copper tube seems to be wrapped in an extremely thin layer of gesso or a particulate adhesive. It's been difficult to make out the exact components of this covering layer. The copper tube is decorated with alternating white and blue rings with a really exquisitely carved bone or ivory mouthpiece at the end, which we have traditionally called uh, a mouthpiece. Inside this mouthpiece is some form of a uh, wooden stopper or what we originally thought was perhaps the end of a glottal or reed, approximately two millimeters square, held in the tube with some form of gum. Another possibility that we discussed earlier today is that it's part of, uh, of the conservation work done last century and is an attempt to support the fragile copper tube from the inside. And, um, and, and, and I think we're closer to the mark with that. Uh, of course, the, the range and nature of materials, as well as the complex multi-process construction of the rest of the item, uh, the time and labor intensive shaping of decorative rings uh, for uh, this, this item of practice otherwise unknown, as well as the intricate shaping of this mouthpiece. 
would all indicate that it's a high status item and that its construction was part of a broader economic network of material procurement and craft creation. Like the Bezbel, we have a little more information about the modern history of the object, though still no original provenience. It was part of the McGregor collection sold by Sotheby's in 1922 in their pottery section and was bought by a Mr. Commons on behalf of Henry Welcome as part of lot 1798 on July the 6th for the sum of four pounds and 15 shillings. It is simply described as a quantity of fragments in silver, uh, pottery, wood, stone, and earthenware. But looking at the lot in more detail, it's clear that the quantity of fragments predominantly contained faience beads and objects. Where McGregor obtained the whistle from is unknown, but when Welcome bought it, he numbered it a 1738-5 with the description of possibly one whistle made up of alternate white and blue pottery rings on tube, three and three quarter inches long in two pieces and attached a, a sketch. Then came from the trustees uh, of the Welcome Institute uh, to the Egypt Center on the 17th of February, 1971 when it received its current number, W247. And today this, this unique object is a favorite of visitors, but is extremely fragile and was desperately uh, in need of special conservation care when it went to Cardiff last year. And Catherine will give us an update on the on ongoing work with it there in a few minutes time. Uh, but throughout its museological history, uh, since its inclusion at auction with faience objects, the rings encircling the copper tube have been described as pottery, faience, uh, or glass. It was only when examining uh, the object with Ken last May that we, that we thought that white rings were perhaps made of a bone or an ivory, and that the blue rings were not faience, but were perhaps a lapis lazuli or, or a lazulite compound uh, of some kind. On a symbolic level, Lapis lazuli is commonly associated with two characteristics, the hair of divinity uh, and the primordial waters with reference to acts that are repeated in the cosmic cycle. And, and the exact connection between this symbolism and W247 is unclear. Whether it has apotropaic significance like the Bezbel, divine connotations for the user, or is simply a marker of status is a topic uh, for further inquiry. Of course, lapis lazuli is only attested from a few sources, most uh, significantly um, of, pardon me, Afghanistan uh, and Taj Taj Tajikistan. Investigating the provenience of materials can tell us more about the trade routes and economic networks of material procurement in the ancient world. And I hope that uh, as our work with this piece develops, we can begin to turn our attention to these more interpretive questions, building on the more technical, analytic work we've been focusing on so far. A continuing analysis of what may be left of the copper, particularly to find the arsenic, uh, lead or tin content, um, would help to ascertain a broad chronological range uh, for the instrument. Because in general, in general, higher arsenic concentrations indicate a date pre-second intermediate period. Uh, with tin bronze introduced by the New Kingdom before becoming dominant with a lead concentration in the Third Intermediate Period. Unfortunately, more specific chronological distinction of metals uh, will not be possible until the corpus of analysed metal finds grows. Uh, for now, we can only use metal content for the most broad date. But with objects like W247, where there is simply no textual or iconographic evidence, Analysis of the material and construction are vitally important to our understanding. And even in cases where various evidence exists, texts can be ambiguous and iconography inconsistent. The materiality of surviving artifacts, while having its own problems, provides tangible information that complements and enhances other data focuses. And this is why it was so great uh, to be able to have this piece sent to Cardiff and not just to preserve it, but also to take the opportunity to try and glean any kind of further information from it. Of course, a conservation is not a magic bullet which tells us the answers, uh, but it can provide 
of very useful data and even more intriguing questions. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'm going to hand over uh, to Catherine. Thank you to um, Ken and to John for the invitation to speak this evening um, about the, the whistle and the conservation work that we've been doing at Cardiff this year. So as John and Ken said, I'm a second year um, student at the Cardiff University, currently studying for my MSc in conservation practice. And the, the whistle is one of the objects that I have been working on. And really there's been two aims um, to our work. Um, one of these, as John said, was to increase the information that we know about the materials. And secondly, was to, um, to reduce the old adhesive and to reassemble the object for display. There is a wide range of materials and a relatively small object which can be um, co make conservation more complex and um, as John said they have also been labelled quite differently over time. So we decided to use um, a range of analytical techniques to try and reveal more information about them and I'm going to share the results of those um, with you now. So here we can see the whistle, the above image is the before and sorry for the poor quality of the after image. Um, this is where I'd gotten up to um, by the start of pandemic lockdown. And um, we can see that the surface is um, very much less visually distracting now that we've managed to get some of the adhesive um, and the labeling off as well. And the image on the right here is um, one of the early discussions with Paul Nicholson um, Professor Paul Nicholson from Cardiff University and um, a discussion about materials there which really helped to inform the way that I went forward as well. So we, here we can see a digitised x-ray and um, which shows the, um, the whistle under four different settings and probably the images on the right hand side of the screen are the most useful and here we can see that the decorative rings and the mouthpiece appear quite translucent um, in comparison with the brighter white of the metal tube in the centre. This is due to the density of the metal tube and this contrast then enables us to see the internal structure of the object, especially where there are rings, um, the decorative rings are concealing breaks and also we can see the um, the blockage that um, John had in the photo we can see here just I think you can see my cursor I hope you can um, up here in the mouthpiece and we can just see this is um, myself just taking doing the x-rays I thought you'd like to see behind the scenes um, and so this is really useful for getting a different idea of how the um, the object looks inside as well so then um, we moved on to using um, ultraviolet photography. Um, photography using ultraviolet radiation is a really useful form of non-destructive um, analysis that can help us aid the, or aid, sorry, the identification of different materials. And in this case, it was the past material, past repair materials, sorry. And, and this really enables us to narrow down the treatment options that we might be looking for as um, ways to remove this. Um, this works just because the different compounds available with it, oh, different compounds within the materials, they react differently um, to the ultraviolet wavelengths. And here in this image, you can see this kind of the glow here, this milky green and white. Um, of the adhesive and that coloration is normally associated with a cellulose nitrate type of adhesive. Another way for us to look at um, adhesives is to use a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and this requires samples which are approximately two millimeters squared um, that are taken from the object and then are exposed to an infrared radiation and this can give us information about the compounds that are present within the um, material. 
So for the whistle, I took three samples and the first one was taken from the area that you can see fluorescing in this photo. And this was the spectrum that comes back off of this is then um, compared with a database. And here the database came back with it probably being a vinyl acetate or a vinyl chloride um, based polymer. Um, so even though I've been given kind of two different potential um, adhesives from these two different types of analysis, this is still really useful to me. And it means that I can then look for a, um, a solvent that might potentially work on either of those um, adhesives and um, just helps to narrow down what solvents we look at. One of the other samples was taken from the kind of the black material that John showed you a photo of that um, is wrapped around the metal tube and this came back with a close match to a bitumous material which was an early form of adhesive and therefore we, this could be original part of the object. So we then decided to take a look at what the metal tube could be um, made out of and to try and find a bit more information about this. And for this we used a technique called um, x-ray fluorescence, which helps to give us information about the elements that are present in the metal tube, but also we did also do the blue ring as well. So the metal tube had no um, surface preparation. So this spectrum is really of the corrosion on the surface as there is very little, if any of the metallic core left of the tube. So the spectra on the screen shows us a very a large peak here for copper and then a much smaller one down here for calcium. Um, and one bit of future work that I do need to do is when I get access to the software again, is that I just need to look for um, a small lead peak that I have written down in my notes and um, and this was a quite a common alloy, to, uh, common metal sorry, to alloy with copper and it's really used to aid the casting properties of the copper. We could find here that the calcium peak is actually present as an impurity, um, it's come from its life cycle or it could be that it is part of the corrosion product that we find on the surface. So we also analysed the blue band and here we got a really large peak for calcium and then um, small peaks for iron and copper. These could also be impurities um, but this was kind of not completely con very conclusive. So we decided to use a more sensitive technique then to um, investigate this material. And so we moved on to scanning electron microscopy and this was used in energy dispersive spectroscopy mode. And you can see here on the right hand side of the slide, this is one of the pieces of the whistle and it's just on the, um, the microscope stage here and then this door will shut and in the background here you can just see some of the sensors that this piece of equipment uses. So we use this because it has higher sensitivity and it's able to detect the lighter elements um, within the material rather than say the x-ray fluorescence. And on the slide here, you can also see the spectrum for the blue band, which shows us strong peaks for elements which would align with those found in lapis lazuli, such as the chlorine, the calcium, sodium, aluminium, silicon and sulphur. And I'm still in the process of cross-referencing these with um, glass compositions as well, just so that we can start to eliminate those. But it is um, very useful in providing further information about what those blue bands are created from. We also took a spectrum from the white bands as well and here we had really strong peaks for calcium and others that also align with this being ivory but we would also expect lots of these elements to be present in bone as well but here it means that we can combine this information with our visual 
observations of these rings where we see the lamellar structure, but also in lack of evidence of the Haversian system we would expect to see in bone. And therefore, it helps to increase our certainty that this is a form of ivory that we are looking at. And so with all this information is taken into account um, when devising a treatment plan, and here it is really important to consider what solvents would remove the adhesives and the gums and the previous repairs, um, but would not damage the materials beneath, especially the ivory, which is incredibly um, fragile and the porosity of the ivory makes it quite susceptible to changes in um, water or liquids around it. So after some research and testing, I tried two different, um, different solutions. One was a 50-50 um, solution of industrial methylated spirits and water, and the other one was a, just acetone. And between these two, these really helped to soften or remove the different bits of adhesive that um, we wanted to remove, or at least take them down to a lower level than was there previously. Other areas, we also I had to take um, use a scalpel to do some mechanical cleaning of the adhesive, and we also removed the label that was on the mouthpiece, and this will be reinstated in a possibly less uh, visually intrusive um, position. So the future work here is to think about creating an internal support to help link the three um, different pieces and. Um, and then think about re adhering the, the pieces back together. And um, yeah, so that's the, the work that we've been doing so far. Um, yeah, and I would just like to say thank you to um, Ken and also to Phil Parks and um, Paul at, um, at the university for all their help with the information. So it, it seems uh, that for the moment, our instincts uh, about the material. Uh, being I, uh, the materials being ivory and lapis lazuli are somewhat close to the mark. It's unfortunate that the copper is so badly deteriorated, but if there is a lead peak, that may indicate uh, a later date, certainly later than the second uh, millennium BC. Now, I'm not going to push that so much because uh, that analysis and treatment is ongoing, so we're not ready to commit uh, to these preliminary findings yet. And if any of you have any questions about that side of things, you'll have to direct them to Catherine at the end, uh, as she's the expert here. But, uh, with an object like this, we of course want to find parallels. In this regard, the uniqueness of this particular instrument makes reliable analysis very difficult and blurs the lines between interpretation and speculation. Uh, several people uh, who have gotten in touch with me have suggested that, have suggested that it may have been part of an aulos or some similar instrument, uh, either Hellenistic, Egyptian, or perhaps Mesopotamia. I must admit I've not found uh, convincing parallels for our quote-unquote whistle, and it seems to be quite different uh, from a standard aulos. Uh, Auloi are generally made up of four constituent parts, uh, which are on this, your screen here. Uh, the bombyx with trumpamata or finger holes, uh, the hufolmion, the holmos and the glottal or reed, uh, which can quite clearly be seen on the, on the Meroway alloy, for, for instance. And I've got an example of how a reed would probably work uh, here uh, for questions about our mouthpiece. Fortunately, our whistle doesn't really easily correspond with any of these pieces, unless it is perhaps a very unusual version of, of, of perhaps this piece here or this piece. Yeah, but it's, be, it's a straight tube without having a distinctive bulb. I don't think it could be from uh, the bombyx, because I don't see how any finger holes would work with the arrangement of rings uh, around a copper tube that's smaller than a centimeter in diameter. And the, the case is made even more mysterious uh, by the fact that my woodwind and brass playing friends have unanimously told me uh, that the, mouth, the mouthpiece on our whistle would be impossible to play if it were anything like what it is today uh, when it was in use. So there really are a lot of questions and, and not many answers.
But as work continues, we hope to slowly, to continue slowly uh, picking the lock, revealing the secrets of these objects, which at first seem rather modest and self-explanatory. But I hope you've enjoyed uh, this overview of some of the musical objects in the Egypt Center, that we've given you a glimpse into a small part of the work going on with the collection at the moment. In particular, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and questions about our mysterious whistle, a case that has plagued me now for, ne for nearly two years. Uh, as we continue uh, analyzing the more technical aspects, we hope to begin looking at ways to interpret the information we find in ways I outlined at the very beginning. Uh, art artistic questions, why was this object made in this way? Compositional questions, uh, what sound or sounds were made? And cultural questions, how was it perceived uh, and intended to be perceived? And communicational questions, how and where uh, was it used and transmitted? But for now, unfortunately, there are still more questions uh, than answers. Uh, but we are making headway, and we hope to be able to write this up sometime soon. And so, uh, in closing, uh, there are a number of people I need to thank. Uh, Doctors Ken Giff Griffin and Carolyn Graves Brown for allowing me uh, to work with the collection and for their help with this project. Uh, Dr. Corp Young for her conversation and suggestions. Professor Von Leven for her suggestions as well. Uh, Dr. Belia for discussing Greek parallels with me. And my musician friends who are always happy. Uh, to remind me of how musical instruments uh, actually work. And finally, I would like to thank all of you uh, for sticking around and listening to me and my hobby horse. And I hope that when life returns to normal, you'll be ready and waiting uh, to come visit the Egypt Centre. Uh, in the meantime, a huge thank you uh, to those of you who have been so generous in supporting the Egypt Centre during this difficult time.